Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the Jodas Hour. Today we have Karina Prieto, 1.7 billion views on TikTok so far. Ooh. An influencer, yeah, got some <laughs> stats with me. 800,000 plus on TikTok, as well as 85K plus on Instagram. One thing though, that 1.7 billion, I did the math, had to look up this stuff. I was just, I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but when you add together the population of the United States, as well as China, they have less people than you have viewers so far. Wow, that is crazy. That's huge, right? Yeah. <laughs> I've never even thought to think about that. Yeah, no, not many people would, but I decided <laughs> to check it out. want to make Thank sure you. the Jodas Hour is going to separate itself from the competition a little bit here. Obviously. So, Karina, can you give the audience a little bit of a timeline on your start as an influencer? Okay, sure. So, I have just always posted on social media. Um, I remember when Instagram came out, and I was like, ooh, I don't even know, eight, maybe? And my friends and I begged our parents to let us get Instagram and we would post like 30 times a day. And then um, I legitimately started posting maybe like in junior high. I would like, take pictures of my friends like in our backyards and stuff. And then um, I went on America's Got Talent and that is where I got my initial following. Um, and then I got about 10,000 followers from that I think I was like 14 years old. And I thought that was like huge. And it was huge at the time. And so then I remember I had like a few companies reach out and just offer to like send me something for free. And I was like, oh, maybe I should keep doing this. TikTok came around and then I started making TikToks. And that was in quarantine in 2020-ish. And um, it just never stopped. <laughs> I just, just now consumed my life fully. Um, but it's been... I don't even know when I guess it really started. It just never ended. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Would you kind of say it grew from the America's Got Talent experience? Yeah, that was the first bump I got because I just had followers like every other girl in like her eighth grade or whatever. And then since I did a lot of the interviews and stuff on America's Got Talent for my group, um, people just found my social media and stuff. And then, yeah, I think I got like 10,000 from the whole run of America's Got Talent, I got my big 10K, and then it all went from there. Yeah, there's not many eighth graders with 10,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah, How'd that, that affect crazy. your social life is one thing I want to learn about. Oh, gosh. Honestly, pretty negatively. I had a pretty bad high school experience. That was like, yeah, it was really bad. I ended up leaving early. I graduated as a junior. Um, so I decided to go online after my sophomore year. And then I finished up and I did my senior year at the same time as my junior year, I'm pretty sure, online, like just simultaneously. Um, and I just wanted to get out of there. People, I think it's just, it was different at the time. I will give them everyone grace. And it was different at the time and like not, and not really many people were doing it. And so I understand like the little kid bullying or whatever, like it's not that deep. Um, but at the time it sucked, it sucked a lot. Um, but I got so many good opportunities out of it. So, I mean, no regrets. <laughs> yeah, the thing it kind of reminds me of, since TikTok's pretty new in the whole atmosphere, it's when people started being YouTubers and making money mm -hmm. in the early 2010s, they get made fun by their friends for oh, it. Because yeah. they, they had no proof they could make money. Now there's concrete proof. Now people know like, yeah. you can become a millionaire <laughs> through this type of thing. It's that was huge. the thing. It took a long time for anyone to give me like any respect for it um, until they saw me start doing like the cool things. Um, then everyone loved it. That was the funny thing was that everyone hated it until they didn't and then they wanted to be in them. <laughs> um, so it's just funny how it all comes around. Um, but whatever. Yeah. Once you start getting success at first, people will kind of try saying they're in your corner since the beginning. Like, yeah, we've always been behind you, Karina. We knew you could make it when you didn't have any fan. They yeah. weren't there. Oh yeah. No, yeah. I literally had someone reach out to me when I like had gotten like bigger and um, she was like, oh, yeah, I just I've always been in your corner. I'm like, you literally made fun of me. Like, no, you didn't. Like, it's just people are just so funny. No, it's but. great. I, I, if I named every person who, told, oh, I, who was told me personally that I was going to peak in high school, it would go on and on. I'm glad I didn't peak yeah, in high school. You don't like, want to peak in high school. Peaking in high school is not a flex. No, not at all. <laughs> no. It's crazy. Yeah. No. No, you do not want to peak in high school. You luckily avoid that. But I want to go back in the conversation. But before we do that, I meant to introduce, we have a producer on the show now for the Jodas Hour. Ooh. First ever time, Aiden, my roommate, is stepping in. Hopefully going to be the full-time producer. We're going to figure that out. Hopping back in the conversation <laughs> with Karina, though. I want to ask about the America's Got Talents experience. How was that when you're a little kid, you're in eighth grade? What was it like being on the front stage showcasing for everyone? Wow, that was that was life changing. That whole thing was crazy. So I basically like Reader's Digest version. That was my church choir. 
Um, and I had just I had joined it when I was like tw- eleven or twelve, and I was one of like the first two or three members. Like there was no one there, and then um, it just kind of grew from the kids at the church and stuff. And we would literally just sing on Sundays at the church, and then we posted on YouTube because the uh, church was like televised or whatever, and so the clips got posted on YouTube. And America's Got Talent came to us and asked if we would like be a part of the show. So we didn't have to do the first audition of America's Got Talent, so that was cool. And then when we got to the first one, we went in fully with the mindset that like we were just going to go for the exposure and like we weren't going to get past the first round, but like it was just for like marketing more so. Um, so we like practiced for, I don't even, maybe a year, like months and months and months and months um, for the first rehearsal and, um, or for sorry, for the first round. And then we performed in... Uh, like this big theater and I remember it was like the longest day ever and we have kids in the choir they're like five years old so it was quite difficult um and we performed and I think we got three yeses and a no I'm pretty sure someone said no to us but we did not expect to go through at all so that was like the craziest thing that ever happened and their big note to us was that we just needed more like we were a little underprepared because we're a church choir. Um, And so then for the next round, we came out a little bit harder. We had some choreography. (laughs) Um, And getting the little kids to get that was really hard. Um, And that was the round we got the golden buzzer. So that was like, that's probably the coolest thing that's ever happened in my life to this day. I would attribute to the golden buzzer. Like, that was so cool. I have a box of it, a shadow box in my room full of the glitter that they, like, drop on stage when you get that. Um, so that was really cool, and that opened a lots of doors for us. And we, um, after the run of America's Got Talent, um, got to do a lot of cool gigs and sing with like the Pentatonics and like Josh Groban and the huge artists and stuff like that. So it was that was amazing. America's Got Talent was awesome. Great. I was gonna make a joke about you getting the golden buzzer. That is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's actually yeah. That is one of the things out of like my life that was that is so crazy to me still because I used to watch America's Got Talent with my dad like every single episode we would sit there and watch and we'd have our favorite acts we'd like make bets on who was going to go to the end and stuff and then like i remember i'd watch golden buzzer compilations like in my room on my ipad when i was a kid and now like i'm in the golden buzzer compilations like that is so crazy yeah i used to watch those with my parents too that is insane i might have watched you get the golden buzzer at one point that is insane Uh, when i when my friends found out about this um they like all looked up a video and a bunch of them were like i've literally seen this before and i didn't even realize um, so yeah, that was crazy and millions of people and you're so young um, and TV is so crazy. Like we, I didn't, I just didn't go to school for like two months um, and I, I missed so much school. Wow, that was horrible. I missed so much school, but it was an, inc- an incredible opportunity. Yeah, at the end of the day, I'd missed two months of eighth grade so I get the golden buzzer. That is yeah, awesome. That, it was awesome. And that whole process was from like, I think of the first round I was in eighth grade then the second round wasn't even until like I was in high school. Like it takes a long time to film it. And then I think we finished like right before my sophomore year. It was like a two year experience for that wow, thing. Yeah. And then between, they also invited us back to the America's Got Talent champions and we performed there. Um, so I was like in the America's Got Talent atmosphere for like three years, I think. Yeah, I knew you were on America's Got Talent. I didn't know you were on America's Got Talent legend. That is so <laughs> sick for you. I think it's we got a little lucky because um, Simon Cowell loved us. Um, and he, I think, owns the show, produces the show, question mark. Um, so he really fought for us a lot. And then for AGT Champions, it was all the winners of all the seasons came back to compete for like an ultimate winner. Um, and we got to perform as like the opener or the closer of that show. Um, and he brought us back for that. So shout out Simon Cowell. Yeah, that's a life changing <laughs> experience. Simon Cowell, too. That is so cool. Right. A, a legend. That's so sick. Did Was Howard Stern one of the judges on that show by any chance? No, it was Howie Mandel, um, Mel B, Heidi Klum, and Simon Cowell. Wow. And that... then the guest judge that gave us the golden buzzer was Ken Jeong. Ken Jeong. The <laughs> comedian. Yeah, they used in the hangover. Right. Was that him in the hangover? Mm-hmm. Ken Jeong? Yeah. He's so good. He is awesome. Yeah, he's the one that does the doctor stuff now. Mm-hmm. He... Yeah, he's the he's Dr. Ken. Ken Jong's, I've definitely seen that video. I've seen when he gave some guy a golden buzzer. That yeah. was you guys. That is so it's cool. It's awesome. And then right before he pressed it, he said, um, from all of us to all of you, and he pressed it. And then we, I have like this, the little box, and then there's like a little note on it that says like, from all of us to all of you. Well, from all of us 
to all of you. It's like I have that video on my phone, like saved. I just watch it sometimes. Like that golden buzzers, <laughs> I like still makes me emotional when I get it. It's so cool. Yeah, I could be feeling so sad about anything. I just rewatch that video. I feel great about <laughs> right. myself. That is right. such a cool experience. So you said that there was some choreography involved in the second round of the act. I know mm -hmm. that you do dancing and stuff like that, and you do that on your TikToks. Is that how you kind of adjusted to it, knowing that you were actually skilled at choreography, or how'd that come along? Um, yeah. So that was like not a challenge for me. I more so helped with like the little kids. I was a, I was a lot. I was involved a lot with like the leadership of the choir being that I was like one of the older ones and that I had basically like started it like I was one of the first members and stuff um, and me and Miss Sarah the director uh, were very close so I helped her out with a lot of things um, and I think I actually helped her with the choreography like this was so long ago it sounds like I wasn't even my life but I <laughs> so much has happened in my life I like forget all the details of all these things but um, yeah, no, I remember teaching those kids the choreography, though, was so hard. And then at one point they said um, like that Miss Sarah in the audience couldn't be doing the like choreography for them. And that was going to be like a huge problem because they're literally like five years old. Um, and so that was all just very stressful. Also, TV is um, just not awesome, like the way that it works and they like switch your songs on you really fast and tell you like, oh no, you can't do that. We're cutting this song, we're cutting it in half. Oh, we're actually not gonna air your audition at all. Like it's just a lot of logistics that go into it, yeah. But. I think the fact that you got that experience and that exposure when you were that young let you know what the TV industry is about though. You're gonna be ready for it now when you mm -hmm. go into that field eventually. And it was awesome for me too because I've always known I wanted to kind of do the broadcast thing. And then um, when Miss Sarah chose me to do like the interviews for the group and stuff. And I got to do like the press conferences on like the red carpet red carpet and stuff like that and answer all the questions um, for like the reporters and stuff. Um, that was like kind of how I got interested in doing the reporting side, if that makes sense. Um, so it kind of brought a lot of things into my life that weren't there before. <laughs> yeah, the amount of things I had to line up for you to be at the place you are right now is insane to think <laughs> yeah. about, Karina. You did competitive dance when you were younger, right? Mm -hmm. So competitive dance, the interviews that you took place on America's Got Talent had to add up to you even going into broadcast journalism, but the competitive dance is what kind of led you doing the TikToks, led to America's Got Talent, mm -hmm. led to where you are now, <laughs> which is just insane to think about. Everything yeah. happens for a reason, no matter what you think, or no matter what anybody thinks, it's true. It's just how it yeah, goes. Yeah, I was actually just talking to my mom the other day about, I was like, how am I 19? Like, I feel like I've lived so much life and done so many different things. Like, even this choir, before America's Got Talent, we did so many cool things just through like the televised services and stuff and got to sing with so many cool people. And then when I was younger, I sang in this like opera at Carnegie Hall in New York and stuff. Like it's just like so random. I forget all these things that have happened to me and that I've had like the opportunity of um, or the opportunity to do. And it's so crazy. <laughs> yeah, you live more life than some people have when they turn 50 performing at Carnegie Hall getting the golden buzzer. That is just those two alone is crazy. We yeah. haven't even gone to half of the stuff that you've done since. And that's <laughs> when you were a child. Yeah, that, those eight. are all <laughs> under like 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy, Karina. Yeah. But no, that is so awesome to see. Thank I, you. We were talking about things happen for a reason. I talked about it last podcast, so I'm not going to go too, too deep into it. Aiden, actually, my roommate, I met him at a Celtics game. He sat one seat away from me. He was just telling me he this telling before, me? Okay, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, if you want to hear that story, go check out the last episode, actually two episodes ago, with Lexi Alston, episode 24 of the Jodas Hour. Give him a little shout there. Going back to Karina now. I apologize about that. <laughs> no, no, that story was crazy. Yeah, while we're talking about awesome things that happened, though, you're sponsored by Body Armor. You went to a Body Armor <laughs> event. Can you tell the audience about that? Because that blew my mind when I found me out. Me, too. So, um, I when I got to college, got really into fitness. Um, I always kind of have been. My dad is super into that and my brother. Um, but I just kind of started taking it more seriously last year when I got to college. Um, and I just, like anything, because I was already posting on TikTok, I just started posting about it. Um, and oh my gosh, first of all, let me preface by saying when I go back and watch my old fitness videos, I want to rip my head off, okay? I didn't know what I was talking about. My form was horrible, so don't come for me. Um, but we all start somewhere. <laughs> so anyways, I started posting my fitness content and um, I'm not managed by anyone. So that's usually how you would get like your brand deals and stuff, but I am independent. So my mom and I manage like my emails and stuff like that. So I got an email um a few months ago asking if i would do a body armor video and that first of all was like crazy to me so they offered a payment um 
and then sent like the product for me to use and I just had to make like a fitness video or whatever it was like a one-time deal not like a long-term relationship or anything like that it was so cool though I remember filming it um in the crunch in East Lansing and I was like so embarrassed because I was in the gym um but nonetheless it went up and it did well and they were very happy with it and then um I got a DM on Instagram right before spring break and they said this is an invite only um, event that we're having and we're inviting you and also Carrie Underwood's gonna be there and that's huge for me because I love country music that is like my number one genre and I love Carrie Underwood um, so I remember I was sitting in my bed and I called my mom and I had to get permission from her to miss class um, because I was gonna have to fly home a day later from California um, and obviously she was like, well, it's Carrie Underwood and Body Armor. So yeah, you can miss one class. Um, and I went to the event. I got a plus one. So I took my best friend, Charlize. Shout out, Charlize. Um, and we went and there was like little name tags on the mats for us. Uh, there was only about 40 people, I think, invited to go. They all had plus one. So there was probably like 80 people there. Um, and then they had like custom airbrush shirts. Uh, we got to take pictures with Carrie Underwood and then we did uh, like a group workout led by Carrie Underwood and then we all got to like take pictures together make videos it was like super pretty um, this was in Los Angeles also I didn't state that but I was home for spring break and so that's how I was able to go to it um, and so that was awesome and I when I walked into the venue started crying <laughs> that was a huge one for me because it was something I was so passionate about being that it was like fitness and stuff. And then also body armor, like my, I, I buy body armor like at 7-Eleven before class. Like it, that was just crazy to me. That was probably, probably the craziest one I've had yet. Um, and like I said, just cause it was something I was passionate about too, about fitness and Carrie Underwood. Like, oh my gosh, that is so crazy. Um, and like my guy friends, when I told them that I was going to be able to go to that, they were all so jealous. They were like, I drink body armor every day at the gym. Like, where's my sponsorship? I'm like, post on TikTok. It'll all happen. I promise. Yeah. So that was kind of a culmination for everything you've done so far. Mm -hmm. You finally got validation for all the fitness. All the That's TikTok like exactly stuff. what it was. It was like a sense of validation. Yeah, I, have, I imagine. That's so, <laughs> cool. so was yeah. everybody at the event just different type of influencers? Yeah, it was cool. I saw. Um, so there were people that we already knew, obviously, from just like being in the influencer world and like living in the houses. So I saw some people I used to like live with and then there was like um, like professional dancers, like this one girl, Delaney Glazer, she's like Justin Bieber's backup dancer, she was there. Um, she sat right in front of me and I only know that because I'm obsessed with Justin Bieber, um, fun fact. And so therefore I know exactly who she is. Um, so she was like sitting right in front of me and then a lot of fitness people, um, cause that's obviously the niche that Body Armor is in. Um, but yeah, it was just all influencers, um, there was even like some family channels there, I think, too. So it was like a cool blend of people. And we had like there was like really healthy food and everything. They did a great job. Yeah, the amount of name drops throughout this podcast has been <laughs> so cool. Karina. That's sick. No, that yeah. is awesome. I imagine getting to interact with that different that amount of different people in your field was something awesome to see. You know, you're at the top echelon of what you're doing. You're mm -hmm. not just one of the bottom feeders at this point. You're yeah. really just succeeding in the field. And that's awesome. While yeah. we talk about the influencer stuff, what was it that made you kind of want to involve the broadcast journalism stuff as well instead of just fo like purely focusing on being an influencer? You came to college, a lot of people making okay. as much success as you wouldn't have done that. So college for me was like spontaneous, which just sounds so insane to say. Yeah. Like that is something people like plan about forever. But honestly, so after, let me like lay out the timeline. So I decided I was going to finish high school early because I was having a really bad experience. And then I... That's when I started, when I graduated early, I started living in the houses, um, like in Los Angeles and stuff. And so then when I was in that, that's also when I was making like the most money I've ever made in my life. Um, and so being in LA also is way more convenient for this type of work because that's where all the events are and stuff. So um, it was in my best interest at that time to not go to college and like to kind of keep pursuing what I was doing um, and like take like a gap year kind of instead of going straight to college. Um, and so I kind of just put the college idea, honestly, not even on the back burner. It was nowhere. Like I was so, so in the LA world for better or for worse. Um, and then I just kind of, 
had parted from the houses and I was thinking about what I really wanted to do and social media was never what I wanted to do. It just happened. Like I just got lucky um, and then decided to like use it, you know, more. But I, I never like planned to be like an influencer or anything. I always knew I wanted to like have a normal career. Um, and do like TV anchoring or like radio broadcast or something, something like in that world. So I figured I needed to go to college. Um, so I did a little bit of research and I had a few people that I knew from Michigan. Um, and I had come here in the summer to visit and I was in Gross Point in the summer. So it was gorgeous. And I was like, oh, I like Michigan. Um, I didn't think about the winter though. Um, and then I got to the like application process and I realized that this is one of the best schools for journalism and broadcast journalism obviously it was a big 10 school um they have big Greek life and everything big sports and so it all just kind of lined up for me and that's how I ended up here but I did not have as much planning I was actually going to go to college for musical theater fun fact um I have been singing dancing and acting since I was younger so I was going to do like the full audition process for musical theater which is super complicated um, and I was preparing for like two years for that and then just said I wasn't going to do it I was like oh never mind and I just did all that work for nothing and my mom was not very happy with me but I was being real with myself and I knew that's not what I wanted to do um, but then you know it all worked out I really really love it here this is like honestly the best thing that could have happened to me I'm happy it worked out. I imagine Gross Point, Michigan in the summer really gave you a wrong idea of the weather yep. here. Yeah. <laughs> yep. No, it's a bit crazy, but no. I'm happy it all worked out. One thing, though, since you did all the acting, all the singing, all that type of stuff, have you ever thought about eventually pursuing a career in acting as well as all this stuff, or has that not really crossed your mind? Um, I mean, when I was, like, really in L.A., yes. Like, I was going to, like, do all those things. But honestly, it's just, like, not really for me. Like, I don't know. Um. I mean, obviously, if I got the opportunity to do something like that, I probably wouldn't pass it up. But my focus right now is obviously like my schooling and all of my broadcast stuff that takes up all my time um, and shooting all my um, packages and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I really, really enjoy it. And I think honestly, they are going to help each other. Like, I think my social media will help me in my career that I'm trying to do anyways. So I don't think it like hinders me really. I mean, I guess it depends who you ask, but because, yeah, it does depend who you ask. Um, but to me, I think it's a beneficial thing, especially with the way things are going. Um, there's this um, anchor named Caroline, um, and she's like huge on TikTok. And she now like has gotten hired at like these huge, huge stations and everything because she has this big following and stuff. So I used to think for a while it was going to hurt me. But I am hoping that's not the case. <laughs> no, whoever tells you it's going to hurt you is just wrong. I can say that flat out right now. There's nothing better than more exposure when you're I trying agree. to go into a career like this. I if agree. you can have a following behind you that actually supports you, it's going to be massive. Mm -hmm. Whoever said that, I can't believe would even and try And I agree because like, those whole things are like about who's watching. Like, Then I would be, in like theory, bringing more people to watch. So I don't know why it would be really a problem. But you'd be surprised at how many people have told me, like, oh, you have to, like, wipe that off the face of the earth before you apply for any job or anything. I'm like, why would I do that? I've worked for years for this. <laughs> like, no, there's no way I'm not, I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's not like you're just posting dumb videos either. You're putting hard work. And you said earlier you got lucky to succeed in this. You didn't get lucky. <laughs> you put the work, and I've watched your videos. I think I got lucky initially. But, yeah, no, it, to, to keep it is hard. Um, but also shout out to my mom because she is the one that, told me to do the reverse and start posting about my like journalism stuff on my TikTok. And I was like, mom, no one's going to care about that. No one cares. No one wants to see me do that. And sure enough, my mom was right, <laughs> as always. Um, and I started posting about it. And it's not like it doesn't do like crazy well, but people are interested in it. So I'm kind of hoping the goal is to post like more about that a lot throughout next year and stuff. And then kind of like turn my social medias and start pivoting that way while also still doing like the stuff I like but kind of like maybe focus it more um, and then I think it'll really help me like in my career.
Well, so. this career is kind of an untapped market for the behind the scenes. You see <laughs> sometimes maybe years after a product's finished, but you're giving it live as they're mm-hmm. making it. That's a huge market that's untapped. Yeah. I've got to say you're completely right. Whoever is out there doubting their mom, your mom's right. I will just tell <laughs> She's you. She's right. Yeah, I have thought with 100% confidence that my mom was wrong about things, came back, something magically shifted, and she was right every single time. Oh, my time. mom, like, I swear my mom's never been wrong. Like, no. it's so frustrating. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's so crazy. frustrating. Because be, you'll have to be on an argument with them, and you're, you start thinking, like, you know, I really want to point back to an argument I was right about before. I can't think of one. She has mm-hmm. been right every single time. It's crazy. Yep. <laughs> so if you, you've said your mom was a big thing in you reaching this point. Was she always just supportive of you, or do you have to oh, get her on your side at a point? Or how that? My go? gosh, my mom is the world's best mom. Nice. Like, it literally doesn't get better than that. Um, no, she was always super on board. She's always been super supportive of me. Um, like I said, she does like my emails and stuff. I don't even, I say we do it, but I really don't do anything. She does it for me and she is awesome. She has negotiated for me. She's reached out to brands for me. She did, she got the body armor for me. So shout out mom. Um, no, she's incredible. I never had to convince her of anything. She was always on my side. I, I love to see that. You're basically a Lamar Jackson of TikTok. Yeah. His mom represents him <laughs> in the NFL. I'm pretty sure he's the only QB without an agent whose mom represents him. That's pretty that cool. That would be me if yeah. I was in the NFL. Because <laughs> my mom, um, she also, like, I didn't drive until this year, like this past summer when I was 19 years old. Um, and so my mom would have to drive me, like, every single day. I live in Orange County to Los Angeles for the All That America's Got Talent stuff every single day. Like she has like a whole job and everything drove me everywhere, drove me to every cl- like every dance class, every rehearsal, like literally my mom ha- is if I didn't have my mom, like I would not be doing all this stuff because I wouldn't have been able to like even be at the opportunities that I was given. So shout out mom. Like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> huge shout out to her, I imagine. Yeah. One thing, though. Um I had about four different things on my mind throughout that <laughs> no, conversation. I wanted to talk about the content. I was not going to talk about that yet. While we're talking about your mom and all that type of stuff, I have heard constantly as years go on, people from California just not getting their licenses right away. Why <laughs> is that such a big thing in California? Okay. I want to know about that. I don't know. Um, so for me, I also have epilepsy. Um, so I wasn't able to get my license because you have to wait a certain amount of time between like your last episode do you know what epilepsy is? Yeah, you okay. get seizures. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So but between your last episode and like when you can drive. And so I had, um, I got diagnosed when I was like 14, right when I had been on America's Got Talent. I was also in the midst of like finding out that I had epilepsy and like getting medicated and stuff like that. Um, so I got medicated, but then I had another episode um, at the end of my freshman year, I think. And so that put a hold on me being able to get my license. And then since I was already late to it, I was just like, I don't really care at this point. Like I'm already behind and all my friends could drive. So then I would just go with them. And then I came here and I couldn't have my car anyways. So then it didn't really impact me at all. And then this summer I finally realized like I'm actually a full adult. Like I need to get my life together and learn how to drive. But I think most of it in California comes from that um, you don't really need to drive. Like, I mean, you can like take there's a lot of public transportation and stuff like that um but everyone around me always drove i was like the only person that never drove and honestly i don't care for it still like it's not really i just don't enjoy it <laughs> yeah some people just don't like drive. i know snoop dogg doesn't even drive at all he's a personal <laughs> driver everywhere. i, I think love all, snoop dogg yeah everyone even my mom loves snoop dogg he's kind of my mom one. loves snoop dogg <laughs> he's the, i think all the stuff you do with betty white is kind of just what ingrained him as just he's every just mom's awesome. favorite yeah you, you're great guy <laughs> Well, as we talk about you, Karina, one thing I wanted to really get into, you lived in a content house in Las Vegas for a little bit, not just L.A. So how was that experience and what was it like being a little bit away from home? Because obviously Arizona is or Nevada, I mean, is close to Los Angeles, but it's not right next to each other. Yeah, that was something. So I was 17 when that happened. Um, Like, that is so crazy. (laughs) Um, So basically, I was already in L.A. involved in all the houses and stuff. And those are all run by like the same kind of company. Um, that puts on all those houses and that company wanted to make one not in Los Angeles. They wanted to kind of branch out. Um, So they picked Vegas. And I was actually cool. I got to be a part of the process um, of like the creation. So I was like the first member of it um, before it was like released or anything. Like I was like where the idea started. And then we kind of like built off of it and decided like what we wanted to do and whatever got the house. And being in Vegas at 17 is... I don't even know what the word is. It's so 
odd because you're not of age to do anything so you can't do anything but then you're also in the desert so like the only option we lived like right by the strip the only option is the strip but you're 17 so what are you going to do on the strip so honestly the entirety of that like I don't even know how long I was there not long like three months four months um the entirety of that time was either in that house or like we would go to the strip and like walk around or something but we really couldn't do anything it wasn't really a, a good location for we were all under 18 I'm pretty sure um and and if not all under 21 so it still didn't matter um and so we were just kind of like stuck in the desert really is like what it felt like it was like an island and there was not really any like creators out there or anything to collaborate with so it was hard like we only had each other in the house to like make videos with and stuff and sometimes our friends would come out like from LA and stuff but other than that it was like an island it was I literally felt like I was on an island um, but it was fun I mean it brought opportunities and stuff to me like I said that I never thought I would have and also living away from home like that at 17 was pretty interesting although it is close enough like for a drive my mom would come and see me like sometimes on the weekend um, but I had I don't know I've always been independent my whole life um, I've always wanted to like live on my own move out that whole thing so it wasn't necessarily like a problem for me there I think my mom was more affected by it probably in that sense than I was because I was just like a teenager having fun and I wasn't even thinking about it but um, yeah I don't know I independence has never been a problem for me though so the f distance or anything didn't scare me but I wish it was just a different place because Vegas just wasn't really a good choice. <laughs> yeah, in theory, Vegas seems awesome because it's always bustling. Yeah, it sounded great. On. Yeah, but it wasn't great. <laughs> yeah, in practice, you're all under 21. You can't really experience anything. Then obviously, COVID and stuff happened. That yeah, shut it was down the it was in strip. the middle. Of, yeah, COVID. So, just I don't know. It didn't really work out. <laughs> yeah, kind of the right place, wrong time type way mm -hmm. of thinking. But I obviously imagine your mom was very happy to have you back, mm -hmm. especially with how close you guys seem. Yeah, that must have been very nice for her back. One thing that happens when you do that type of stuff. You were saying earlier that you were late to get your car. You were early to graduate high school, early to live by yourself. <laughs> so when you're living by yourself, or not by yourself, but with other people, not mm -hmm. with your family, when you're doing that type of stuff, you're experiencing adulthood younger than you oh, should. Oh, my gosh, yes. Yeah, what does that kind of do to your mindset? Did you kind of get lost in it for a little bit? Had to get kind of dragged back out? Or how that? did you handle it fine? How that go? I would say I got lost a little bit in L.A. in the beginning of it because I was, like, barely 17, I think. When that was happening, and that's just, L.A. is a beast. L.A. is will chew you up and spit you out 50 times over and over again. Like, that, that is just a crazy environment. So I think I got a little lost in the sauce at the beginning. Um, but honestly, I got tired of it pretty quick. So I kind of snapped out of it and got, like, more focused and wasn't waking up at, like, 3 in the afternoon anymore. Um, I kind of got my life back together. Um, but also, I learned so many life lessons um being by myself by myself just like away from my family um i remember calling my mom when i got to vegas and i was like so how do i do my laundry <laughs> um and it was just kind of funny between us because like we've talked about like i'd done so many things in my life and like didn't know how to do my laundry like it's just so so odd but i had to learn uh, like also, also financial independence that was really interesting for me um, to start one making money but also using my own money um, is was crazy because I had no concept oh that's the other thing that was bad when I was in LA my mom we should have my mom on here because <laughs> she could probably go on for hours about I was so off the rails and when I had first started making money because I had never I've never had like an actual job like worked at like PacSun or something like that um, so I had no concept of money whatsoever, and I would burn through that like the, like I had like I had to like there was like a ticking time bomb on it, and that's like one of the most dangerous things I think is being young and having money like that, because that's where I saw a lot of people around me um, slip kind of into more unfortunate things. Is just having money that young is dangerous. It really is like <laughs> it's like in a joking way, but also like in a real way, it's like really dangerous. Um, so once I learned how to manage that, it, everything got a lot better. I feel like when I was in Vegas, I was a lot more adult than I was in LA. Um, and, and I just gained a lot of independence and I really owe a lot of my like maturity to that point in my life because, wow, a lot happened. <laughs>
Like, you, wow. Do you think getting that independence so soon and experiencing living financially alone, living alone away from your parents made it easier to go out of state for college? Did that kind oh, yeah. of transition over? Oh, yeah. No, I, I didn't even, uh, I wasn't even thinking of going anywhere near home for college. Like, I knew I wanted to go try something different. Um, I wasn't nervous about it, really. The only thing I was nervous about was um, when I found out that Michigan is like, like this school is like pretty local. Like a lot of these kids are from Michigan and I didn't know one person going in except for my roommate. And we hadn't even actually met. We had just like met online. And that's how I was, co- that's how I was going to show up and like pack up my whole life and show up here and not know anyone. And so that's what I was scared about. But I wasn't scared about like my ability to like be far from home or anything. I was just scared about like making friends. Um, but honestly, all my friends still call me like the mom of the group. I think I'm just like, I gained a lot of maturity that people don't even get the chance to like get because they're not put in the same situations. Um, and so I think I just owe a lot of my knowledge to some of the messiest parts of my life, which was that. <laughs> yeah, sometimes all things seem like they might suck in the moment. They end up being massive for your growth. Mm-hmm. Growth is insane when you go out yeah. on your own, especially. I, I've just went from Massachusetts to here. I've matured a ton. But for you, you're doing at 17, going out to Vegas. Now you are in Michigan. Mm-hmm. That's huge. That's massive. So many people don't ever get that type of exposure in their life to new experiences. Yeah. I think it's great. Like, I love Michigan. And I love the like, the people are so different here. Um, so much nicer <laughs> um, and I just love like the way of life I don't I still think I will end up in California it's hard for me it's hard to get away from California when you're from somewhere like that it's like I mean that's like where all my friends go to vacation like how am I supposed to leave it it's so hard I like tried to think of other places to go and California just really calls my name but I love Michigan like I don't mind being here at all when I'm at school yeah, no place is as active as at Los Angeles, though. That's one massive thing. Not even just Los Angeles. You go to Sacramento, there's stuff. I was going to say, there's so, there's places to do everywhere in California. Like, you can go to snowboarding and go to the beach, like, on the same day. Like, it is really, honestly, such an awesome place. It's just so expensive. Yeah. Like, uh. <laughs> no, I know. A lot of money, but there's a reason for it. Yeah. There's so much experience that you can get from them. You got to pay for what you're getting is how that right. goes. Right, Well, that's not too bad. I'd rather have... Just you gotta make a little bit more money to enjoy the experiences and like everything sucks there or anything. It's not oh too, yeah, too yeah, bad yeah, yeah. No, no, it's great. And the weather, I mean, personally, I know, but like also I know people like that come from places like this, like actually enjoy like the winter and stuff like that. For me, I think it's hard when you grew up in like constant summer to go anywhere that's not like kind of constant summer. Um, so I'm trying to find something maybe in the middle. Like, I don't really know what that would be, but I need, like, I need a solid summer. That's, like, a necessity. I need a summer. Maybe try, like, South Carolina or something. That might work out. <laughs> Pretty nice right. area down there. But, no, one thing. We were just talking about it. Is that when you came here, I experienced this exact same thing. When the people were so nice to you, mm-hmm. I, I actually want to check if you experienced I realize you didn't say it expressly. When they were so nice to you, did you think they were faking it at first? Because oh, I, yeah. I was yeah. honestly uncomfortable at first. I was like... <laughs> why are strangers talking to me right now like you I don't think people understand when you talk about like the LA rudeness or like the California rudeness it's like a thing like obviously I have like people I love and are nice and stuff like anywhere but there is like a general like aloofness that comes with especially Los Angeles especially Los Angeles but California in general Um, but the Midwest lifestyle is so much like slower and friendlier and like I find like very family oriented and stuff and I just really love like all the people that I meet here and like all my best friends now are like from here and stuff so yeah, I think the people here are awesome but I was like thrown off when I got here even just like walking down to the walking down the street people like wave at me and I would be like wait like do I know that person like that's so weird um, but no, it's just nice Midwest people. <laughs> it doesn't seem genuine at all mm-hmm. at first. You've got the California rudeness. We get called mass holes. That's how it goes. Oh, people right. Are not, Forget yeah. you guys are from Massachusetts. Exactly. Yeah. East and West Coast, for some reason, the rudest people all mm-hmm. the time. That's just how it goes. Midwest, as you mentioned, it's a lot more slowed down. Mm-hmm. One thing for the Midwest that I want to talk to you about, you joined a sorority here. You're part of Alpha Phi. How has that experience been for you? How has that been for your adjustment? You went from independent to being part of a group. What was that like? <laughs> So that's why I did it. Um, I basically was trying to think of any way to meet people. Um, and I had seen like a, I think a YouTube video or something random had come up on my feed about sorority rush. And I called my mom and I was like, we should look into this. And my mom like started laughing. She's like, you are not going to be in a sorority. Like I, 
would never ever think I was going to be in a sorority. And then I was like, oh, whatever, I'll just rush, I'll try it out. And then I went to all the houses and it was like, okay. I mean, I was meeting nice girls. Like there was really nothing, nothing wrong with any of them. It just, I was like, oh, okay. I don't really know if it's my thing. And then I went to Alpha Phi and honestly, it sounds so cliche, but it really felt like, like home. Like it felt like I didn't have to pretend to like try and impress anyone. I felt like I was just having like normal conversations. And every time I left, I remember that I was sad to leave. Um, and every, like the rush process is like, like two weeks long. Um, and so after every round of it, I just remember I was always like sad to leave Alpha Phi and I was always hoping that they were gonna ask me to come back. And I wasn't really having that feeling with anyone else. So then fast forward, I got my bid. And then on bid day, which is when you find out what sorority you're in, um, I was actually sitting next to two like random girls at the time. Those two random girls are now my roommates and some of my best friends in the whole world. Um, so it has brought me, like I said, my best friends, um, also leadership opportunities. I'm on the executive board. Um, and also just fun things like formals and date parties and sisterhood events. Um, also networking, that's a huge part of it. Um, even just the other day, I was like emailing with someone from a company who was um, alumni of Alpha Phi. Um, so it's just like great all around, I would say. I mean, it's hard having hundreds of girls, you know, together. Uh, you have to work through some things. <laughs> um, but overall, love a -fee. I imagine that was a big adjustment too and helped you mature as we keep talking about different experiences mm -hmm. making mature. You learned how to live with other people. You experienced that in the other houses, but not to that extent. Oh yeah, there's nothing like living in a house with 55 girls. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. It is so fun though. It's honestly, we're all like joking about it because we're moving out in two weeks. Like I'm so over this. I can't wait to get out. But it has really like been some of the funniest, even like um, deep moments like getting to know people and having like deep conversations and stuff um it's all a really unique experience that i think if it's your thing you should definitely pursue but if it's not don't because you'll be miserable <laughs> yeah it's different for different people yeah, some it, people love it some people it's hard stuff. like i i've met people who are it's their thing um i'm kind of like somewhere like in the middle where i really love it but um you know i have my things about it that i i don't love um but overall, I really like it. And then some people, it's just not their thing at all. And if you like continue to stay in it when it's like that, it just makes it such a bitter experience. Um, so definitely, I would say go for it if you want to, but maybe not if you're not into that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. If, you're, if it's something you're not into, it's a lot to force yourself to be a part of. There's a lot of obligation and stuff. It's not all fun, you know. Oh, for sure. You have to give up a little bit of part of yourself if you want to commit to a oh, group yeah. like that. And there's like, you know, you have to like kind of like earn your place. You have to, there's like trainings we have to do like, um, you know, through, this is like a whole, there's like a national council and then there's like a council at the school and stuff. There's lots of roles. Um, so it is a lot to like kind of put yourself there if you're not really into it. Uh, one thing I keep noticing throughout this entire thing, you just have so many new experiences every time throughout <laughs> yeah. your life, it seems. Every year you've experienced something that almost nobody else has. <laughs> but one thing, you're talking about how for that situation expressly, if you're not really into that, you'd be a bit negative. One thing I noticed about you when I was researching all this stuff is you really like to have a positive mindset. Mm -hmm. How did that develop over the years? I've always practiced gratitude. I didn't first semester. It was saddest I'd ever been. <laughs> Finally got back to it this semester, and now we're back to the positive attitude. What was that like for you in your case, though? High school. High school, um, the worst time of my life was high school. Um, and I think my mindset now comes from that I got through that. And so like, it can't get much worse than that. That's like literally where a lot of my positivity comes from is that, well, at least I'm not in high school anymore. And let me tell you, if you're in high school and you hate it, you won't ever think about it again after. Like, I promise you won't see those people ever again. Like, it's not a big deal. Um, but in the moment, it feels huge, and it did feel so huge. Um, but I think positivity, honestly, is, like, so underrated. Like, also, shout out to my mom. Um, I used to be super negative, and I would always be, like, an I can't person. Like, I would just always doubt myself. And my mom always told me, like, your mind is so powerful, and it listens to you. And I was like, mom, shut up. Like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But it's so true. Like, the things you say to yourself really affect yourself. And good or bad. Like, I think literally everything you feed yourself becomes, like, a percentage of you. That's, like, how I think about it. Like, the things that you put into yourself 
is exactly what you're going to get out of it. Um, so I think filling your brain with positive things is a better way to fill your brain than with anything else. <laughs> it's massive. One thing, some people at home might be able to, if they've never expressed gratitude or anything like that, they might be able to relate to this a little bit. If you spend too much time on your phone during the day, you're not going to feel as good as mm -hmm. you would otherwise. That's because of all the negativity on the internet. If you go yeah. in the comment section anywhere, you're going to see negativity. Ugh. That's just how it goes. The internet sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Not the best. It's how you can make money, but not yeah. where you should live your life is the thing. I agree. So I imagine that since you've had all these experiences, you're not on your phone for the entire thing. You're experiencing mm -hmm. them. Maybe you're filming them, but you're not going to be scrolling through Instagram the entire time. You're going to be meeting Carrie Underwood. You're going to be getting the golden <laughs> buzzer. You're right. not recording that through your phone. Right. Something like that. But throughout these experiences, what is one of the biggest things that you've kind of got to experience? I haven't talked about you. We talked about Carnegie Hall a little bit earlier. Maybe if you want to talk a little bit more about that, that could be cool. I really love the positive mindset, <laughs> and it brings you to such special places like these experiences you've had. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. One of the biggest things. Well, body armor, for, I think body armor for me personally was the biggest thing. I mean, to other people, probably America's Got Talent. Um, I think one of the cool things that I have done is, um, do you know the Pentatonics? I do know Pentatonics. Okay, so after America's Got Talent, we got to sing with Pentatonics at um, the Forum in um, Inglewood. I think it's in Inglewood in um, California. And it's like one of the biggest concert venues, I think, ever, or in California, at least. Um, it's huge. There's like 20,000 people or something like that. Um, and I remember... That was so crazy. Like the pentatonics, especially like in that era of time, they were such a big deal. I mean, they still are. I still listen to pentatonics, but I mean, like they were such a big deal in that era. And for us to sing with them at the forum was so crazy. And like we we got to rehearse with them. They were so nice. Um, but that was that was huge. Yeah, that's life changing. Getting to yeah. experience something like that. And doing everything else that you had to do, was there ever a moment where you started to feel like there was a little bit of pressure building up? Like, how am I going to top this with the next thing I do? Or do you not really experience that? <laughs> I feel like I used to think about that when I was a little bit younger and, like, maybe, like, naive a little bit, thinking that I had to, like, top myself over and over again. Because I feel like I was like that for a while. Especially after, I think it happens on social media a lot, too. Like, when you hit, like, let's say when I hit 500,000. I remember exactly where I was when I hit 500,000 followers. And I remember after that, it's like, oh, shoot, well, now I have to get the next milestone, which is like whatever you think it, whatever it is to you. But I remember that is stressful, especially when you are on the Internet, because I, I, I say everyone has like a shelf life kind of like where people care and then they don't. It just kind of happens to most people on the Internet. There's like very few creators that have like really good longevity. Um and so I think that's really stressful is like, when's my time going to be up? Um, and it's hard when it's your career as well and your income because you're like, well, yeah, this is great right now. This is awesome. But then when's it going to run out? Um, I feel like I don't really have that mindset anymore because I feel like I'm pleased with what I've done and I'm content like with all the things I've accomplished already. And now like my life's going in a different direction, if that makes sense. Like I'm not I still do the social media and everything. Obviously, it's I just posted like an ad right when I walked in today, actually. Um, but it's just not really my full focus right now. I'm really trying to focus on my like future career and school and stuff like that. So I don't really think about topping myself really anymore. But I definitely used to think about that all the time. <laughs> I think that mindset they have now is extremely important. I've talked to countless countless athletes about a lot of S's in that word. Almost <laughs> <messing up. laughs> countless athletes about it. And a lot of them, they have a really hard time separating themselves from the sport. I've obviously brought yeah. up Michael Phelps before. He was one of the biggest guys where it's you feel like without that sport, you're nothing. But for this case, it'd be without the viewers, without the subscribers, that type of stuff. Yeah. What am I? Now you've developed it. You're still a broadcaster. You're someone who can work on all that type of stuff. You've got the acting experience. You've got the singing experience. You have a lot of things to look back on and still be proud, even if you're not succeeding at the moment in that. Right. Yeah, no, I, I had to come to terms with that because also – it's a fleeting thing, social media, like, and it's inconsistent. If there is something that's inconsistent, it would be being a social media influencer. Like, anything, views, income, everything is inconsistent because um, algorithms change and your viewers change and trends change and what people want to watch changes. And that's like very human, but it's not convenient when you are the person producing the content. Um, and also, like, you're, like you said, separating yourself from it. Like I was just, we were talking before this started about how I don't really watch TikToks a lot anymore 
that used to be a big part of my life. And I found that it like consumed my life. Um, not even in, I guess, a bad way, but I felt like literally I would look back on my day and it was just TikTok. Like that was it, especially when I wasn't in school and I was like doing the full time stuff. All I, all that was happening in my life was TikTok. And so now I've kind of come to this part where I like really am focusing on balance in my life with my friends, with my family, with school and with social media. And I just find myself like healthier, not always being on it. And that also comes from like, you know, the other things that come with being a, a person that shares their life on the internet um, or a lot of mean people, a lot of gross people. Um, so I just kind of like s- took a step back this year. That was like one of the things in my like New Year's resolution that I was going to focus on was like taking a step back from social media for my own good. Um, and I actually enjoy it now more because towards the end of this past year, I was like going to stop doing social media. It was just not going where I wanted it to. And it was really stressful with school. And I really was like, I think I'm just going to, I think I might just be done. I remember telling my mom, I was like, I think this might be like the end of it. You know, we've done good things, but I think I might be done. And I kind of had to get like a second wind and like a little bit of re-inspiration. And I think I owe a lot of that to not like consuming my entire life with it. Now it's like one part of my day and it's more of like a job, you know, like you clock out of a job. I like have to clock out of the social media thing. So that's like been what I've done. That's so hard to do too. The fact that you're actually able to do that is huge. It's hard because like everyone's always on TikTok all the time and everyone's on Instagram. um, And I'm kind of trying to do the opposite while also my job being on the app. (laughs) Um, So it's hard, but I think it's working right now. And I'm going to keep trying to do that because um, I lost a bit of the spark in like the video creation process for a while, I think because it's all I was doing. Um, so now with more balance, it's like kind of more of a fun thing again. Yeah, it's not your whole life. It's something that you enjoy, something that you can actually put time into without yeah. just being negative about it. One thing I wanted to talk about is when you kind of put a little bit of extra focus not to be using your phone, it's crazy to realize how much people use it, right? Oh, have, yeah. Have you ever gone to a comedy show or not really? Um, No, I don't think I have. So during the summer, I went to Bill Burr's, went to Kevin okay. Hart's. Yeah, really cool stuff. I'm a big comedy fan as well. Okay. Thing. But one thing about it is now, they used to never have this, it's huge, is so that they can't record the performances and leak them, they put your phone in a little magnetic coat, so oh, that's, that's locked awesome. into- awesome. Yeah, but when you're just sitting in line waiting to buy food, no one's scrolling on their phones, they're all mm-hmm. having conversations, it's crazy to see. Honestly, I would love that, like at a concert or something, because I'm guilty, I, okay, I say I've stepped away from social media, right? But I'm like a picture video girl, I love taking pictures of everything, not even like for, not even myself, or like for, like to post on Instagram, but I just love taking pictures of everyone. I carry my camera everywhere. And I'm like the historian for my friends. I take pictures of everyone. And then like that that night I'll make like a Google Drive and send it out to everyone. Like I just love being the picture taker. Um, but I also like have been seeing um, videos lately of like concerts and stuff and it's just all phones. And it's like, okay, I totally understand because like I just went to a concert like a few weeks ago and I like recorded pretty much the whole thing on my phone but then I saw a video the other day and it was like of a uh, Sabrina Carpenter's concert and all I could notice was that there was just phones everywhere and I was like I mean okay yeah but are you really gonna rewatch it like I feel like the moment might be better if the phones just weren't there yeah. which is kind of crazy because I also want the pictures and videos but I feel like we'd all enjoy a little bit more if there was no phones. <laughs> it's weird to think that for so many years, everyone was asking, we want more improvements on phones. We mm. want it to be so we can spend more time on phones. And now that we've gotten there, we've gotten to the peak of it, and I can't even imagine how far there it goes, because it will go farther eventually. Now that we're at what seems like the peak now, we kind of don't want it. We yeah, kind of like, want be it. be careful what you wish for. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So you'll always talk about how so many little kids will have certain problems because they've spent so much time on the internet, hard time adjusting to actual society because during quarantine, the only way they interact with people is over a screen. Right. You can't have that. That's not what society is supposed to be. Right. You watch any movie, even if it's made now based in the 1980s or 70s, life is completely different. Obviously, movies aren't a direct right. comparison to real life, but it's a little bit of a showcase of how much phones have changed the world. I can even see, like, in my younger siblings, um not even in a bad way, but just my, like, you, they live life so differently than I did. And we're not even that, I mean, me and my younger sister are four years apart and she has having a completely different experience than I was like, because when I was doing the social media in high school, no one was doing it. Now she's in the opposite problem where everyone's doing it. 
And so it, it's just, I can't believe how different it is. And then for my younger brother, he's the youngest. Um, his experience, I can't imagine, is anything like mine was. <laughs> um, no, it's crazy. But the whole be careful what you wish for thing is always apparent because I always say that to people. All my friends at some point have said, like, I wish I had, like, what you have. And I totally understand it. But what people don't think about is, like, yes, do you make a lot of money for 15 seconds like yes you do I'm not like I'm not lying yet you do make a lot of money you get to do cool things but you also get a lot of things that you don't get in a normal job such as um like death threats and hate comments and um like people picking and commenting on your body in positive and negative ways is super weird for your mental health especially as a 16 year old girl that it was one of the things I had to get through a lot. It was super hard. Um, and so like when you're at a desk job, right? Like, I mean, generally you're not getting like death threats, right? Yeah, most <laughs> um, you most might not get paid as well, but you're not getting death threats. So there's like other things. I mean, I'm not saying it's like a bad career at all. I mean, I'm great. I'm not complaining. I mean, I still haven't had to have like an actual job yet. Um, so I'm not going to complain about it, but there are there's a perspective I think people miss when they say stuff like that, that it's like, well, you don't really know what you're signing yourself up for until you do it, because I did not know what I was signing myself up for, and I was not ready for it. Like, that used to, hate comments and stuff like that used to really, really affect me. It, I really don't care anymore. <laughs> um, but it used to really, really suck. And like I was saying, as a 16-year-old girl, people like commenting about how you look when you're already in like the most insecure stage of your life. Ugh, it's brutal. <laughs> not, not really a good thing for it's self-confidence. Yeah. Yeah. When I was studying, preparing for this interview, I didn't even check the year. Now I'm a little bit scared when I think about it. But I saw like a two page fan fiction about you. I was like, oh, oh. what is this? I was trying to find like details about your life, that type of stuff. That's not good for it's, your mental health. It's horrible. It's, I don't even know what, to, how to explain something like that. Like the blatantly inappropriate like sexualization of yourself being that and you're that young and you're seeing that is it does something to your mind like I remember the first time I saw something like that I literally was like uh, <laughs> like I don't even know what to think about this now it's like so normal I like scroll by it and I'm like oh yeah okay, well whatever <laughs> um it shouldn't be normal though don't act like that on the internet please <laughs> um it think about the person that you're talking to yeah we, we laugh about it now but if it's your daughter, if it's your sister, your mom, yeah. you don't want them to become numb to oh, comments. No, like no, that. no. No one should be normalized to stuff like that. And that's, and then you think about it and you put me in perspective with, I think I'm technically considered a micro influencer. I would say so. I'd say micro celebrity for sure. I think I'm technically like still considered micro with like over 700,000 followers. So if you think about it with people that have like millions and millions and millions and millions of followers, imagine all this but like multiplied by like 20 like that's what's so crazy is i have to keep myself in check too because i'm like wow i experience all these things imagine what the other people are experiencing and it gives you also a different perspective of like commenting and stuff i like very rarely will comment on someone's thing now because even if it's not even if you don't mean to things come across so differently online like I can tell sometimes people are like trying to compliment me or something and it just comes off like typing, you know, different being from different places of the world. It all can just come off so differently. And also you don't even know what you're like, how what you're saying can affect the person. Like you might not think at all that what you're saying will hurt. Like I've even seen like Ariana Grande actually just recently made a video asking people to like stop commenting positively or negatively on her body because she's like I can't take it like either everyone's super happy or they're not happy at all and I they were happier when I was lighter and then now now I'm too now I'm too heavy and now I'm too skinny and it's just like people like that like Ariana Grande had to step up and be like chill like that's when you know like we all have to be just a little bit nicer and gentler I always say be gentle because I think it's better to like err on the side of being like too nice than like slightly a backhanded compliment <laughs> um but yeah I just kind of stopped commenting because I can tell when people are trying to say something that they meant was nice but I'm like uh that makes me super uncomfortable <laughs> um yeah so it just gives you a different perspective when you're on the other side of it also like of fandom like 
I'm not really like a fan of anyone, which is super weird because all my friends are all like, they all like love like certain creators and stuff. And I don't find myself like that because um, it's kind of weird for me in that I've been like in the same place as like a lot of these people at the same time. And so it feels weird for me that, to then be like a fan of them. Um, so that's also weird. I don't like consume content in the same way that a lot of people do because um, it's like a different mindset, I guess. I don't know. Well, you've experienced differently. It's the same as an yeah. athlete watching someone play football. They're probably not as intimidated to walk up to them and say, hey, they've yeah. experienced it. Yeah. So I think that's one thing that's massive. I'm happy that you're able to adjust. It does suck that people are like that in the comments. <laughs> yeah. One thing, sometimes it's just flat out, it's just not even close to what <laughs> what is a good thing to say. But sometimes yeah. it's just they'll be trying to say something complimenting. Oh, yeah. But then there's no tone of voice. There's no mm -hmm. irony. There's nothing like that over text. So you mm -hmm. can't tell what they're trying to see. Or trying to say, I should say. And that kind of just brings across a whole wrong message that even if they're trying to say like that you look good or something, you don't really want to hear that. You're not posting it for compliments about that. You're yeah. posting it because it's what you want to do. It's not, yeah. I'm what going on here, so 50 random dudes comment on how I look. I don't, yeah. like, if my comments were like that, I wouldn't be too, too happy. And it also is that, that that's really annoying when it's something that is not at all about, when I'm making a video about something that has nothing to do with what I look like, and um, being that my followers are mostly male, that tends to be what they focus on. Um, and so it is frustrating like, when I'll post something, let's say about like mental health or something like that. And this like used to frustrate me a lot. Um, I'd post something like about something serious and then the comments are like, what, where's your top from? I'm like, I mean, thank you because you like my shirt, right? Like obviously you're being, you're trying to be nice. There's nothing wrong with it, but you obviously missed the entire point of my video, right? Or just people it's just so funny like also everyone comes from different places so you don't really know how everyone's going to react to everything um so that is also kind of jarring when you think something people are going to react to something a certain way and it goes comp like it hits the different side of tiktok and it just completely like brings out a different audience um it's happened to me a few times um and you just kind of like get bombarded by like whoa that's not that wasn't supposed to happen and on social media, something that's not supposed to happen can happen so fast. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's pretty crazy. I saw this thing on Twitter, it relates to TikTok too at the same point, because it's basically the same reflection. All social media is basically the same for being honest about just different formats. Yeah. But the thing on Twitter, some guy had basically posted something, everyone in the comments was agreeing with him, but then under it, he posted an explanation of it and saying, if you disagree, I don't care, I'm muting this. And people are trying to rag on for that. So he responded to them, if you think that everyone on Twitter is going to agree on any topic, no matter if there's 100% certainty, you're not paying attention. That's not how it goes. Mm -hmm. Same with TikTok. No one's going to completely agree on every single thing. Yeah. And that's what makes it so tough. I We were talking about how there's some certain things that when you say, I wish, you're not really thinking of. Mm -hmm. A lot of people clown on LeBron for this, but it's actually a pretty accurate thing to say. He was saying on Twitter that while people want his lifestyle he can't go to a target he can't go yeah. to a starbucks just get his name on a cup and walk around everyone clowned on for that because it seems like something so silly what do you think about it could you imagine not being able to walk around a supermarket mm -mm. could you imagine not being able to go get coffee at starbucks because they say your name and everyone wants your autograph that's huge that's horrible yeah it's even crazy to give some people a perspective this um is like in a very very small scale obviously i'm not lebron yeah. but i'm saying I have to be conscious of those things. Like when I'm out, especially here at school, because now it's a pretty well-known thing here that um, I'm like the TikTok girl, right? The amount of people I walk by and they're like, oh my God, are you the TikTok girl? I'm like, please no. <laughs> um, but um, like any, when I'm out here, when I'm going out with my friends, like I always have to be a little conscious of what I'm doing, what I'm saying, who I'm talking to. Um, relationships are interesting uh with the following um everything just things you don't think about are way more difficult when you are have so many eyes on you um it's just it's hard and it kind of sucks like always thinking of having to think about what i'm doing and what i'm saying it sounds so dumb but like as a like a college kid right like I mean, we're all like 19, like we're literally still kids. Like I, I think, I still think of myself as a kid. Like I think I'm pretty mature and stuff, but I still think of myself as a kid. And also my mom always says like, she was so lucky because 
at that time, nothing that our, no, no like mess ups our parents ever did are like documented an- anywhere. And now like our entire lives, everything we do wrong is all just laid out on the internet. Um, and so I just have to be really extra cautious in places where like my friends don't have to be in like a party setting. Um, to be super careful about that. Um, it's just, yeah, I mean, you have to, it's like anything, Give you have to give things up to have certain things. And so, you know, it comes with, it comes with the package deal, I guess. But yeah, it is um, kind of stressful sometimes. <laughs> Definitely some good, some bad. And out of context video, out of context photo, any type of thing like yeah. that can ruin your career, especially yep. on the internet nowadays. Everyone and people knows. are quick to turn, like, they they will turn on you instantaneously like you think you have like loyalty until you don't like it it literally i always it's just fleeting everything is fleeting on the internet like the everyone will leave you at once and you'll also gain like a hundred thousand followers in a day like it, i mean it really i could go either way biggest thing for the internet is just the hive mind way of thinking where you know how hives with queens mm-hmm. the, once a queen bee decides something oh, every yeah. other bee decides the same exact thing for the internet once the person who's leading the charge decides something for some reason, everyone switches. No and it's one always wants. random too. Yeah. Like, it, um, when I think my biggest video ever, um, it was like a dance video of me, like every other dance, literally like every single other dance video ever, um, that I've ever done, and I posted it. It was actually like two years ago to tomorrow, I think. Actually, is the anniversary of it. Um, but that was like one of the most substantial like jumps I've ever had. Was I posted it at like eleven o'clock at night, I think, and just went to sleep. And then woke up and it had like a few million views and I had gained like 70,000 followers or something overnight. And um, it was going crazy. It would not stop. And I ended up gaining like I think over 150,000 followers just from this one video. And then my whole account got banned, wiped off of TikTok in the middle of it for three months, two, two or three months. I had no account, no income, nothing instantaneously. So like that's the other thing is like stuff like this could end at any moment that is so scary imagine like walking around every day and your all of your income every like everything you have and in the back of your mind you're just like thinking like oh like this could be over like that i literally think that all the time about i've now gotten banned twice um wrongfully got my account back but it's like kind of an when that first one happened it was an eye opener for me because I was like, well, one, I need to save my money better. <laughs> Two, I need to, like, a job without security is scary. And that's, like, exactly what, in, like, an internet job is, is, like, zero security. Especially on something like TikTok that has problems like that with banning people and, like, removing accounts and stuff. Um, like, you just took away someone's entire career. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, you know, people see an account get banned, they don't really think about it on their end. It's all, oh, I can't watch that person. For the other person on the other side of the screen, that's their entire career. Everything oh, they put my, their time my life, like, came crumbling down that day when, when I woke up and I had no account. Like, literally everything, like, I felt like my life was over. I imagine. It's, it sounds so dumb now. Like, even if that were the case, if I never had my account again, like, my life was so far from over. But, you know, everything feels bigger when you're in it. Um, and I remember that day was horrible <laughs> yeah especially when you're young too it feels mm-hmm. massive you mentioned that we're still kids i always talk with people about this you're not a full adult until you can rent a car like 25 <laughs> right i stole that line from lexi alston that wasn't mine at all. <laughs> I, I will give credit there i want to make sure just in case she's watching this episode. <laughs> but no that is completely true once you're 25 that maybe even after then you're still kind of still exploring adulthood. yeah <laughs> yeah there's no real concrete mark where you're not a kid anymore mm-hmm. that's just not a realistic standard to really set for yourself it doesn't mm-hmm. happen but one thing, Karina, throughout all of this, one big maturity thing that I've seen from you is your humbleness. How did oh. that develop when you have 800,000 people following you? That's crazy. Okay, I, honestly, I think I um, owe this to living in California because no one cares. <laughs> it's like, you know how many, come on guys, like you know how many people have 800,000 followers? Like, honestly, a lot, of, a lot of people. Like, it's a lot It's a lot of followers, don't get me wrong. I still have like existential crisis about sometimes where I'll like look up a picture of like 700,000 people in one place and I'm like, oh my gosh, all those people follow me. Um, so it is crazy in that way. It's a lot of people, but I mean, it's easy to get that many people because there's so many people online now. Like, I come across people every single day that have like, I've never seen before on my For You pages have way more followers than me that, I mean, it's just now everyone does it. Um, But it's just kind of like, there's a difference also between having followers and having like a marketable account 
and also in having like a fan base or a support like whatever you would like to call them your followers um whatever some people like have millions of followers but you know not re it's not really like any loyalty and then you can't really push a brand or anything so i mean there's people that have like 10,000 followers that probably make like triple the amount of money that I do like it it really doesn't matter like you're nowadays especially like someone with like a thousand followers can make a full career out of social media which I think is awesome I feel like it's like anyone has a chance kind of thing it's huge it's all bridging the gap between the poor and the rich type of thing where there's so many avenues for you to make money mm -hmm. and be successful now it's crazy to mm -hmm. think about but one thing with the TikTok stuff you're talking about how some people don't have sustainable sources of income because of the content they make. When you switch from dancing to more, <laughs> more serialized, more type of stuff about like fitness, what was that switch like for you? I mentioned, uh, you, or you mentioned to me a little bit earlier that your mom was part of that switch. But what was that stuff? You got more into fitness in high school and college, that type of stuff, obviously. So that type of stuff factored in. But what was the switch really in your mind from I just want to do this fun type of dancing content to I want to put something about inspiring people to lift and work out and better themselves? Um, I think it came with like also growing up and like figuring out who I was and not just like trying to be everyone else on the app because like obviously I was like 16 and I was just looking for anything to do that would like make me go viral or that would make me get followers or what. I would just follow all like the ho the hottest like people at the time and do exactly what they were doing. Like I would just go through people's accounts and what was working for them I would do. And it was working. I mean, obviously it was working, but honestly, I enjoy now more doing like what I want to do and what's more authentic to me, even though being fully transparent with you, it doesn't perform like it did. Like my peak was when I was like in those houses and probably right when I got to college was like my peak. Um, because also I think people love a bit of this like celebrity aspect, right? The life I was living was very like not conventional um I was at like these giant mansions in Los Angeles like partying with like actual like literal celebrities like artists and stuff like that and like rappers and it's um people want to watch that not as many people want to watch someone go to school right okay. so I knew that going into college that I was going to see a decline um and the numbers and stuff um and so that was, com I like was completely fine with that. And um, I don't know, I think the shift just happened because I got older. Like that's one thing that's also hard is some people have been following me since I was like 15 and they expect the 15 year old Karina, right? But I'm not, I'm like about to turn 20. I've lived a lot of life since then. And so therefore I am different. And that's like one of the worst comments to get probably is like, she's so different now, it's like, well, I mean, yeah, like if I was still acting like I did when I was 15, you guys would be upset that I was still acting like I was 15. So you just can't please everyone like you were saying. Um, but also like I feel like being humble and understanding like not your place. That sounds like negative, but understanding like that what I have accomplished is like not lucky. It's not lucky because I did work hard, but also I did get lucky from like the jump right like my first viral video that was lucky like it just it went it went viral and then I did something with it but I feel like it could happen to anyone and also I follow people with less followers than me that I think make better content than me that I would like to be more like and so there's also like a perspective thing of I follow so many people that I think don't have enough recognition and I think there's people that have too much recognition and so you can't owe too much like credit to the amount of followers really so I think that's why it doesn't really affect me that much is like okay like I know people have way more followers than me that I really don't like their content and so the following doesn't really matter to me whereas like I said I follow people with no followers that I love their content so the like big the big like 800,000 or whatever doesn't really affect me like that I don't know I think you've got a great mindset on that. that's <laughs> thanks no that's huge i if I had 800,000, I would be the cockiest person ever in the room. I can't That's all my friends that. say. They're all like, I would never shut up about it. And people are usually surprised because I don't ever bring it up. Like outside of if if you're not bringing it up to me, there's pretty much zero chance I'm going to bring it up to you. Also, because I, some people still like, I mean, people are interested in it, but some people do think it's like dorky, right? Like some people still make fun of it. I mean, whatever. It's a, I mean, 
I make money, so like I don't know how much money I don't know how much how much fun you can make of me for it, but um, it's like it. I don't know. It doesn't affect me really either way, like positively or negatively, the way that people look at it now, because like I know what it's done for me. I know that like it's how I am probably going to like jumpstart my future career and stuff. So what people say to me about it doesn't really weigh in at all you're <laughs> unless talk- it's my mom yeah. <laughs> when my mom says i'm like ah oh, okay maybe i should take that video down <laughs> no i said the mom's opinion you can never yeah. get, get mad about or argue against that one's kind of say you're saying earlier that knowing your place was more of a negative way to say it i think what it is for you in a more positive sense is just being self-aware yeah you know where you stand from a third person perspective in the food chain of all this type of stuff and i think it helped that i was always in these houses and with at every like party at everything I was always like the smallest person so it helped that I was kind of always like little sister I was like little sister of every single thing because all my friends that I lived with everyone I was involved with was like in the multi multi millions and so I just always felt like I was not a big deal and so I don't think I ever got the chance to get like the big head because everyone around me was way more able to like have a justified big head than I was right so I'd like keep myself chill um and then so i just never really got to be like the super cocky i don't think i really ever got there um because it's just not really that big of a deal and honestly social media doesn't matter so (laughs) it all comes back to just knowing that you are content or wow almost really messed up content (laughs) there's two different ways to say right yeah content and content we've been talking about content a lot this time but no that you're content with where you are in life right now you're happy you're not reaching for more you're working hard but Mm -hmm. you're not needing another thing to happen to be happy i remember i used to crave like oh my gosh i okay i have to get my next 10k i have to get my and now i i honestly i honestly couldn't even tell you what my actual like follower count is right now i don't even know it's like so second nature to me i just don't really mind it that much but also it's kind of funny because I have this conversation with my mom all the time is that I wish sometimes I had no followers it is like I know every time I say it everyone's like you're lying like you know you don't mean that and I don't in the sense that like obviously this is my job and so I don't want to have no followers but there are things that you give up in having the followers your privacy and then things like opposite that you can't really share if you like really care about them like I said like a relationship that's hard for me I was in a long-term relationship for a while um no one really ever knew about it um because I thought that was like the best way to go about it because I didn't want outside influence I didn't want people getting involved um I remember when I was in high school I posted my homecoming date okay and I had like no followers at the time it was like when I had maybe like the 10k and he got annihilated by the, by like the other guys that followed me and so that has like always stuck with me since that I had to like delete that post I remember it was like so sad and I felt horrible because he felt horrible obviously yeah, poor guy. and so sucks. like when you're with someone that you really like and you really care about and you really love then you don't want that to happen to them so that was a big part of it also and so like I was in like this full relationship that no one even knew about <laughs> um, and that sucks because like as a teenage girl and as a college girl like you want to post up with your boyfriend and take cute couple pictures and stuff and I had to like keep that to myself but for like the best interest of the relationship so things like that people don't even think about that are so difficult when you have followers green you might be the best secret keeper on the air now I read at <laughs> least 30 to 40 different websites and all of them had a tiny little thing at the bottom of she is single she is not in a relationship mm-hmm. from when you're 16 <laughs> 17 18 19 that is crazy the yeah. internet finds everything you managed to block out a massive part of your life yeah I actually had um I've had two relationships in my length of being on the internet that no one knows about nice job karina yeah no that is insanely <laughs> impressive well unfortunately karina i have loved talking today it's been great if you ever want to come back on the show we'd love to have you here but we are running out of time we, <laughs> okay. we have rented out the studio for a certain amount of time have to go over to the next people but i really appreciate you coming on i love this episode we're going to be posting in the next couple of days this was episode 26 of the Jodas Hour with Karina Prieto. Thank you so much. One of the upcoming broadcasters in America, <laughs> already an influencer. Thank you so much for coming on, Karina. You might have noticed throughout this show, I've been wearing a little bit of special merch. You might know Sean Paul Art. He created the intro for this show. He now makes merchandise. So check out Sean Paul Art if you ever want to see that stuff. Thank you, and I'll see you in episode 27.